Good morning, everyone. Today is the day we're finally about to hit pointers, which is simultaneously one of the more exciting bits of the course, but also probably one of the bits that you'll find more challenging. What are pointers? Let's find out. So before we actually get to that point, I want to just highlight one interesting person again from the history of cryptography. This is Lynn Ann Conway, who is one of the big transgender people who has made a very big contribution to the field of computer science. She helped de develop the very large scale integrated microchip design paradigm. And the basic idea here is previously when you had systems that would have all different sorts of chips and you'd have to build connections between all the different sorts of chips, her idea was that we should just treat the computer as one kind of chip, integrate everything together, and make it very fast. And while this design languished for some time, modern computers, if you ever opened up a PC, you'll see your graphics card, and your RAM, and your CPU all in different places. Now if we look at a, who, who here has a modern Mac from the last two generations, an M1 or an M2? Yeah, so the M1 and the M2 Macs actually use this design. They've integrated the RAM, integrated the graphics card, and integrated the CPU all into one package. And this is going to be relevant for us today because we're talking all about computer's memory. So if we see here, we can see a, a close-up image of the computer's memory at the 200 micrometer scale. And all you're seeing here is the different little regions which could be magnetized or demagnetized that would thereby give us zeros and ones. So the operating systems that we use allow us to treat memory like a single contiguous block. Despite the fact that if we were to look at the physical world and we go to our previous slide, we see that memory is actually three dimensional. Uh, if you wanted to figure out where a particular bit in the computer was stored, you'd have to look at this chip. You could find actually down to the micrometer where it was. Um, but our operating system allows us to ignore all of that. Instead of having to know the physical slot inside the computer where it is, we want to instead have an easy way to treat it, to treat it as an address, a different place in the computer that goes from, say, zero up until the size of the computer's memory. And in order to find the 10th the bit, you just access the 10th entry that the operating system gives you. So this is a representation of our computer's memory. Obviously, it looks a little different from our 3D picture of the computer's memory, but this is a really handy abstraction for us. Now, one of the big differences that you'll encounter in C programming is you'll actually have to start dealing with this representation directly rather than with Python, which lets you ignore memory management altogether and just lets you think of the objects you want. So in C, we're actually going to use these addresses and use these locations to manipulate different things inside our program. The operating system also tells programs which places in the computer's memory are permissible for them to use and which places are impermissible for them to use. The first question for the day is why might it be necessary for the operating system to tell us which places we're allowed to put stuff in and which places we're not allowed to put stuff in as a programmer of a single program? Uh, Max, wait, grab this just so everyone can hear. I guess so we don't override the stuff that needs to always be there. So there's the stuff that always needs to be there, like the operating system. What other things should we maybe not be touching? If you write one program and Oscar's written another program, should you be allowed to touch Oscar's memory? No. So why do we need the operating system to enforce things? To make sure I can't change stuff I'm not meant to change. And what are the kind of risks if you were able to change Oscar's program that, while it was running? So let's say Oscar is communicating something super secret to Bell over there, um, and, his, and that's stored in his program's memory, and you've just written another program. What potential issues could you have if, your if the operating system doesn't enforce any boundaries? Could send the wrong message. So you could modify the message that Oscar's sending. So uh, instead of let's hang out at lunch, it could be uh, let's attack at dawn, which obviously has somewhat different semantics. But also you could just read what other programs are doing. And this uh, breaks the property that operating systems should ensure that programs are isolated from each other. So it turns out that this concept is pretty central. Depending on where we get to later in the semester, we might have a fun look at ways that you can break the operating system's guarantees and uh, break into other programs. But for the time being, let's take it as a given that the operating system is going to be really good at enforcing this isolation. If you write to a place that doesn't exist or that you don't have permission to, so one might be if you have 16 gigabytes of memory and you try and write to the position that would be at the 17th gigabyte, well, 
that's not gonna be okay, the operating system will have to do something. Or if you try and access another program's memory, what's the computer gonna do? Segfault. Now this is a message that you are going to see when you write your programs. You will make a mistake somewhere in your code and you will see the program terminate without much explanation except for the message on the computer segmentation error or segfault. This means that the computer's memory has bro been broken up into segments by the operating system and you have touched one that you do not have permission to touch. So keep an eye out for this. We'll see segfaults over and over and over in the next two lectures. So modern, modern operating systems don't actually let you start from zero. Zero is reserved for null. So we know that there's, there's nothing there. Uh, the op because this whole thing is a fiction, there's actually no physical location zero or physical location one. This is just an abstraction or a game that our operating system is playing to make our lives easy. It's perfectly okay for the operating system to say, you know, I'm gonna reserve the number zero to indicate nothing, and then every other memory address will be valid. So zero is going to be reserved for what we'll call the null pointer. It points to nothing. And we'll talk about pointing again in a second. Here is the layout of what a program sees as the computer's memory. So at one location at the very top, we have the operating system, which is all the things that Max said, you know, we can't override it because the computer will stop working. It actually needs some code in there to just keep going. Then we have the stack. And we talked about stacks earlier this week with recursion, with putting bits of the program on top of each other and on top of each other, just like a stack of pancakes. This is also where all your normal variables grow, go. We have a few other areas as well. So the stack is that part over there. The text component is also interesting. It says here, binary image of the process. Now what this means in plain English is that actually all the code that you've written the computer, in order to run the code, the computer has to first put it in its memory somewhere. If, if it wasn't in the computer's memory, you, you obviously couldn't run it. So when you run the program and the operating system sets up the memory for your computer, it has a place for all the variables, uh, the main place being the stack, has the place for the operating system, but it also has a place for the program itself, for all the code you've written that's now being converted into machine code. Uh, we've talked about segmentation faults two seconds ago, and in the context of this, it suddenly makes a bit more sense. If your program is running and you attempt to touch something that's in the operating system space, well, you're not meant to be able to touch that, and so it gives you, the, gives you an error. So back to our representation of memory. And thanks to Jisoo for helping me with our first prop of the class. So I need a volunteer. This job is pretty easy, so don't worry too much. Yeah, come on, come on down, come to the front. What was your name again? You weren't, Bruce, okay. Bruce Stone? Okay. Congratulations, you are now part of our computer's memory. So sit down on the chair, take the memory. And Bruce is going to represent for us our memory as we uh, play along during the course of this lecture. And I need to get some of my special memory tools out of the box. Okay, so we're going to start off with a few different addresses going from a 0x8 all the way up to 0x38. Does anyone know what the 0x stands for? Why am I writing that? Hexadecimal. Okay, so this is hexadecimal. It's just numbers written in base 16. So it's the same thing if you'd written in decimal, the same thing if you'd written them in binary. We just like to use this representation when talking about computer's memory because it's convenient for a number of reasons. Um, so here is our computer's memory and we are going to store a bunch of characters in it. I'm gonna store the characters H, E, L, L, O, and then a slash N and then a zero. And we'll talk about what, what's special about this. Not this week, not next week, but the week after. So this is a series of characters and let's imagine that our mailbox over here can fit one character. So Bruce, I'm gonna get you to write down the letter H and store it in your mailbox. So we're gonna store that in our mailbox. Now, this raises the obvious question. To what label should we give the mailbox? We could call the mailbox H because it's about to have H in it. Thank you, Bruce. Let's put that in the mailbox for, for everyone to see. Here's, here's our letter H. 
Uh, the letter H is roughly what number? You don't have to know exactly what it is in ASCII. Yeah, 70 something. I don't know exactly what it is. 72. OK, let's write 72 on our thing, because we know that H is really just a number inside the computer's memory. OK, and we're ready to put it in slot 0x8. OK. So now I have two ways that I could talk about this mailbox. I could talk about it as 0x8, or I could talk about it by its contents, which was h, h and which is really just the number 72. So one byte is going to be 8 bits, so all our addresses will be moving on in plus 8. And because we're in hexadecimal, it may not look like this is plus 8 every time, but once you learn about this, uh, how to deal with this numbering system, you'll see that these addresses all work just fine. Why not use bits? Why store a whole byte? Why store 8 bits at a time? Uh, early computers actually did store a single bit per mailbox, but it turns out that this is just a bit inconvenient and slow. And so our computer is going to have, again, not just a word size, but a minimum size for an address that we can store. So all our addresses, the minimum difference between an address is going to be 8 bits on almost every modern computer. OK, so just like we had in our mailbox, uh, we had um, the letter H in capital. So here I've actually done it in lowercase, which would be 104. And, but just like we could represent it horizontally, we could also represent it vertically. And this will be just like our diagram a few slides back. There, where we have our stack, and the stack is going from top to bottom in this representation. And if you actually look at the numbers, this whole thing will be placed somewhere, will start somewhere high up in memory. So instead of starting at like 0x8, it'll, it might start at like 0xf, which is a larger number. So it's natural to think of what we have in our mailbox in two different ways. We could think of it as just a number, but what would happen, Bruce, now I'm going to get you to write, oh, let's take out your paper and let's change your variable. Let's change your variable and instead of 72, I want you to write an address on the paper. Pick an address. Okay. Yeah, so Bruce asks, is this an address? It's 0x18. Now, what is interesting about this is when we put it inside the mailbox, where was the mailbox located? Where did we say it was located? We said it was at 0x8, but what's inside the mailbox now? We've got another address inside the mailbox itself. So what we could do is theoretically, if I had another mailbox, and who wants to be my other mailbox? Sorry, you've already been uh, doing too much today. Someone else. Aeon, OK, you're up. Got Aeon over here, who is now our second mailbox. And you are going to be located at 0x18. Uh, actually, let's make you at 0x50. And I'm going to have two things on this paper because I unfortunately did not build the second mailbox. I have the address, which is 0x50, where Aeon is. And then he's going to store some value. And you can choose whatever value you like there. Um, e. OK, and we're going to have E there, which is equivalent to roughly, I don't know, 60, 60 like 70. OK. And let's make this 50 just to make the demo work. OK, so this is fine. We've got two different addresses. They've both got different things in them. This is 0x8 and has 50 in the, in the box. And this is 50 and it has 70 in the box. So what do we make of all this? Why is this useful? This is the magical star of the referencing. Um, that's my term for it. That is not an official C term, but we're going to see how to use this in just a moment, so I need one more volunteer. Yeah. What was your name? Will. Will. And I don't think we've seen you at the front before, so come on down. So the power of the magical star of dereferencing, and this is the dereference stance that I'm going to use, is it allows you to open mailboxes and check what's inside them. 
And the way it's going to do that is it will first look at the number contained in one mailbox and then use it to go to the location specified. So take the, take the magic star of dereferencing. This is an, also known as an asterisk. And you are going to apply the magic star of dereferencing to Bruce. So go over to Bruce. And what did I say the magic star of dereferencing does? Take the microphone, hold it up. Points to the other value. Doesn't point to the other value. What it allows you to do is it allows you to open Bruce's mailbox. So open Bruce's mailbox, take out what's inside. OK, what do you see there? And the other thing that happens when you use the star of dereferencing is you now go to the location on the paper. So 0x50 matches 0x50. And we read out what you find there. So what did you find? E. Now, what would happen if you used the star of dereferencing on Aeon? Aeon, I'd go to 70. Yeah, you'd go to 70. So where is 70? Some, somewhere over there, somewhere over there. So we, what, we've, what we've now created is something called a pointer. Bruce is a pointer because the value inside his mailbox we're using to refer to another location somewhere else. Now is there anything special about the number inside the box? I see a bunch of no's? Yeah, the answer is no, it's just, it's just a number like any other. If you had, had written the letter E or the letter F, they are, you can interpret that as a letter, you can interpret it as a number, or you can interpret it as a location. The key point here being that the computer has given us an abstraction. Locations are physical things, but the computer has given us a way to refer to them numerically. And so what this does, let's repeat the demo once again. Let's put this back in the box. We've got just an ordinary number, um, 50 in hexadecimal, right? And we use our star of dereferencing, do the dance. It was more like this, but we'll let it pass. Okay. What, where are you going? To 50. to 50. And then what do you do? And then we read out the location. Okay, can we have a round of applause for Will? Thank you very much. I need to keep the star. No, this, I've only got one star. These are limited edition. Um, but I will happily send out the 3D print files for anyone who wants them. OK, now I need one more volunteer. Yeah, Young, do you want to come down? OK, I have another tool for you. This is just a regular ampersand. I've, it's not magical. I haven't done anything special to this one. doesn't say FOA on it. If any of you look up close, it says FOA on the star. That's what gives it the magic powers. OK, so you can take the ampersand. And now this is going to give us another power. So let's have our variable uh, Bruce. And what the ampersand is going to do is it's kind of, it's related to the star of the referencing, but it really does something entirely different. All it does is you can go over to a variable and you can find out its address. And that's what the and does. So let's go to our variable Bruce, go over there, use no, no dance, this, this is just a, it's, it's non-magical. Oh, okay. No, no. What I'm asking you to find is Bruce's address. What is Bruce's address? Zero X 50 is what's inside his box. But if, I, if you go up to a house and I say, what's the house address, do you open the mailbox? No. You read the address. So, so what's Bruce's address? We, we said it before. OK, maybe this one's easier. Let's get Aeon's address. Let's walk over to Aeon. OK, and you can ask him if you don't know. Yes, yeah, Aeon, what's your address? 0x50. Yeah, 0x50. OK, so now let's try it with Bruce. What's it? Um, H, capital H. No, capital H was what's inside your box. Right, um, 0x18. Yeah, z was it 0x18 or was it 0? It was 18. OK. Yeah, so the key point here is to distinguish between what's inside the box and where the box is. And this is something like you're, you're going to stuff it up a bunch of times because they're both numbers. You, if you looked inside a house's mailbox and it had the house number inside the mailbox, you'd be doing the wrong thing. You have to look on the mailbox. And this is what Young's 
plain old ampersand does. And this does something different. Okay, so let's demonstrate this one more time. I know you were desperate. I saw you opening the mailbox. What does the star of the referencing do? You can do the dance now. It allows us to open the box. Open the box. Then what happens? You take out some, like, you read the on the, the other side, yeah. It allows me to go to the address. Yep. X50. Yep, go there. Right to this guy? Yeah, put it back in the mailbox. So now I'm going to do something a little different. I'm going to take out our paper here, and I'm going to mess with it, and I'm going to change the number. So now that's 0x58. It's a bit ugly handwriting, but I'm going to put it in the box. OK, Young, you know your, your thing? You've got the star of dereferencing. Let's play the game. Tells me it goes to right, it's 58. 58, you said. Yeah. yeah, I changed it. Okay, so go to 58. You can, okay, nice to see you. <laughs> okay, you can come back. Um, but the key thing to note here is even though I changed what's inside Bruce's mailbox, I changed his variable, uh, Aeon's variable hasn't changed at all. So despite changing this, Nothing has changed here. So you can change the value of the pointer without changing the value of what the pointer points to. And we're going to see how to distinguish these uh, in C code very shortly. Um, so can we have a round of applause for Young? Uh, and a round of applause for Aeon. And I'm going to keep Bruce here for the minute. So let's do this up on the board just to give us another way of looking at it. So here, it's a little hard to see because they still haven't fixed the lights in this room. Um, but we have a pointer, but we see that we have four bytes. And because we're, this is depicting a 32-bit system, because we're on a 32-bit system, all addresses are going to be 32 bits, which is how many bytes? A byte is eight bits. Oh, yeah, four, sorry. Uh, I think I said that wrong. Uh, but yes, uh, we have 32 bits. Four bytes, uh, eight bits to a byte, um, and so we have our address that goes. It's really hard to see in this light, um, but the number is zero x fifty. So it's zero 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 zero, and then zero x fifty. And then over here at the bottom, I have zero x fifty, which contains. Can anyone see what the number is in there? It's the number ten. So zero x fifty contains the number ten. So I have our pointer and the thing that it points to. This is just like Bruce is a variable that starts at 0, x0, 8. Um, and then if we were to use the star of dereferencing, what number would we get back? We'd get the number 10, because we look inside the mailbox. What's the contents of Bruce's uh, mailbox? It's 50, and at location 50 is the number 10. Trixie. OK, so why does this work? Essentially, because everything inside the computer is a number. Letters are numbers, addresses are numbers, numbers are numbers, and they're all just bits and electrical and magnetic impulses at the end of the day. So because addresses are numbers, and addresses can store numbers, we can use the numbers we store as if they were addresses. So we can think of this just like having a whole row of mailboxes. And every mailbox can have inside, let's say they're numbered from 1 to 10, Every mailbox not only has its address, like which number mailbox it is, but it can also store a number inside it. So if you look inside the mailbox, it can store the address of another one of the mailboxes on the row. And this is the whole idea behind pointers. If you get that, you're already halfway to being able to deal with them. Um, so how do we know which variable is a number and which is an address? Someone who doesn't actually already know the answer. What was your name? Lum? So how might our computer know which variable is a number and which variable is an address? Do you have a guess? OK, so I'll help you out a little. How does our computer know if a variable is a character or an integer, even though they're both numbers? 
based on their ASCII. So the ASCII tells you how to convert between the two, but if I do, if I create a variable, how do I let the computer know whether it's a number or a character? We assign them. We assign them. Yeah, and we assign them. And what do we write at the very start of our assignments? The type, exactly, you got it. That's 100% the right answer. So the way that the computer knows if something is meant to be treated as a regular number, like an integer, or if it's meant to be treated as an address, is we just have a type that tells us if something is a pointer or not. Now the way we're gonna do this is because we might wanna have pointers to different types of things, we might wanna have a pointer to a character or a pointer to an integer, we're going to add an asterisk to the end of the type to indicate that the type we're creating is a pointer type. Now notice this is different. This is an asterisk without the FOA symbol on the other side. So this is just a plain asterisk. We're using it in multiple ways. So we could use the asterisk to do what kinds of things? Lum? What, what is the most normal use for the asterisk before, before this lecture? Where would you use this in your C code? For multiplying. For multiplying, okay. And I just said it's got another use. What did I just say we could use it for? Your last answer to the question you said when we want to assign something, we first use a, a type. So we can use it to indicate a pointer type. And then I'll flip it over to the magic star of dereferencing. And we can also use it to actually do the dereferencing operation. So one of the really tricky things here is that the asterisk can be used in at least three different ways in C. It can be used just to do standard multiplication. It can be used in assignment when you're creating a new variable to tell the compiler what type it is. And then it can actually be used as an operation to do this dereferencing thing. And this will be more helpful when we see some code in a minute or two. Thank you very much, Lam. Round of applause. So how does the compiler know if we want to know the address or if we want to know the contents at the address? Well, assignments look different from multiplications because they happen before an equal sign at the start on the left-hand side. And so the semantics of C, the way we write our program, is gonna let the compiler know which of these three things we're actually trying to do when we write an asterisk. And part of your job is to learn these three different ways so that you get it right, so that the compiler gets it right. But hopefully you'll get an error if you do it the wrong way. But we'll see. Okay, so here's our another example, still pretty hard to read in this light. Um, but we have an 8-bit value stored at 20, at that very top bit, so the blue matches the blue. Um, and that value stored there is h, the, the lowercase h. Then we have uh, the 8-bit value stored at 20 plus the size of a character, and how large is a character? One byte. So if we go to 20 plus one byte, where do we get to? I mean, this, this one should be pretty obvious because it's right there on the, on the slide. Yeah, we get to 28. So 20 plus the size of a character, which is one byte, takes us to the next box down, and that would get us to 69, which is I. And finally here, we see how to uh, create a pointer. So we're going to do char, and then at the end, we'll use our asterisk to declare a pointer type. Char star A. And then we're going to set a equal to 60. So at the very top, in that top box, is our variable a. a is located at which address? It's lo a is located at 60. Inside of 60, we have 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 20. And so now if I do this properly, if I get the address of a, a is uh, at location 60. And if I use the star of the referencing, I first go to location 60. I look inside, I see that it refers to location 20, I look inside location 20 and see that there's the letter H there. Now one thing that, the reason I was able to spot my mistake in this case, despite all of us not being able to actually read the text on there, is because I know that a pointer on a 32-bit system is going to be how many bytes? Four bytes, because you need four bytes to make up all the, the full length of the address. And so A should have been four bytes because it's a pointer to a character and not a character itself. A character is how many bytes? One byte, and if I'm on a 32-bit system, how large is a pointer? 
four bytes. And so if I'm on a 64-bit system, how long should a pointer be? Eight bytes. This can also get very, very confusing. Uh, towards the end of the class, you might start using pointers to pointers. So instead of just adding one star to the end of the type, you can add two stars, which means if we were to use dereferencing, we would get to the location of another pointer, and then we could use our star of dereferencing one more time and jump to yet another mailbox and then look inside of it. So you'd actually have to use the star operation twice. Don't worry about that too much for the time being, but this slide will be up if you want to try and uh, wrap your head around it. So the star operator is officially known as the dereferencing operator, not the magic star of dereferencing. That's only this one here. Um, and dereferencing, as we said, it's just like visiting the mailbox, checking what's inside, um, and then going to that location and seeing what's there. Just knowing the address is not the same as knowing what's inside or what's at the location of the thing that's inside. So it's kind of key to separate out all these different concepts. Going to a house and looking at the address, going to a house and looking inside the mailbox, going to a house, looking inside the mailbox, and then going to the address that was inside the mailbox and looking inside their mailbox, they're all different things. So draw, draw a picture out for yourself if you get confused, like a little uh, comic strip, and then label the comic strip with the syntax that would be used to do each of those different actions. That would actually be a fun thing for us to make. Um, so using the AND operator is just like checking the house address, um, and then you can use that address later. Okay, so here we are back at our vision of memory. Now it should be all clear to you, which gives us time for some demos. Okay, uh, Bruce, I think uh, you've probably sat there long enough. We can have a round of applause. He's demonstrated for us very well. Thank you very much. And I probably owe you something for sitting there for half the lecture. Okay, let's look at a couple of demos that help explain to us how this computer's memory is actually working. So we'll flip back and forth to from the slides to the, um, to the code. Let me just set this up quickly. So this is our first demo of understanding how the program actually gets loaded into memory and where things are. So this is plain old boring program. It's not actually doing anything. Let's see what happens if I compile it. Is it gonna do anything? Not, nah. okay. Let's run it, runs fine. Now I'm going to use a command called size and I'm going to actually see what happens when I run this program. Where does it put it inside the computer's memory? So here I see something called text, the section text. And if I go back to my, my slide over here, oh, there we are. I can see there's the text section at the bottom. And who remembers what was in the text section? Said it a bit earlier in the lecture. OK, next to Bruce, wearing the stripy shirt. Don't remember? So I said you need your variables in there. You need the operating system. What else do we need for the program to be able to run? We need the program. So we're going to have the actual commands that the program is going to run inside the text section. What was your name again? Angela. OK. So what I could actually do, I'm going to run another command. And I'm going to peer inside at the machine code of this program. And I can see if I look here, this is my program in the machine code. The other stuff is necessary to like play nice with the operating system, but our int main void return zero, that's these instructions over here, these machine instructions. And these take up, if I look at size, 15 bytes. And so this tells us that it takes 15 bytes for the main part of our program to, um, to be in there. And can get more information on that later. Okay, let's look at a, another one. Also, just to be crystal clear, you don't have to be able to know how to go and look at the machine code of something or how to interpret it. Um, it's just to show you how, what's actually happening behind the scenes. Let's look at layout two. Layout two's a, a little different. Now we have a global variable, a static variable, and a, an, a normal return. So let's do it now. I'll do my size-m, and I'll do layout2. So I see it hasn't really added any instructions. 
Why might it not have added any instructions, despite the fact that I've got extra lines in my code? Yeah, what was, it? What was your name? Afan. Afan. Yep, uh, there hasn't been a sign to about you. Um, that's one version of the answer. The, another version of the answer is, well, I haven't actually had the computer do anything. All I've said is there exist some variables. I haven't told it to do anything with the variables, and so there are actually no instructions. All I want the computer to do is set aside some of the memory, and that doesn't necessarily take an instruction because when you create the program itself, when you compile the program, you're putting something inside the computer's memory, you're storing something on your hard drive, and inside that thing, you can just leave room for the variables. You're not actually doing anything with them. So if I look at what has been done here, I've actually created four bytes of um, variables here and another four bytes of variables here in something called the data section, um, which is divided up into the BSS and the common. And it doesn't really matter that how those divisions work. But here I have the data section and the BSS section, which is where I have static and global variables. So they're actually just being put in this location in memory. Okay, ready to move to layout three. Maybe we'll do something more interesting. Oh, still not. Okay, let's try layout three and see what we get. Okay, so now I have uh, still same thing going on. But this time the compiler has, oh, same thing as the time before. Sometimes compilers, when you don't initialize a static variable, will put it in the BSS. In this case, the compiler has chosen to put it in the data segment both times. Just different names for the parts of computer's memory. So that demo didn't actually end up showing anything interesting because my compiler has uh, betrayed me. Okay. So now I have an initialized global variable, an initialized static variable. Let's see what the compiler does this time. This is one of the fun things about programming is you upgrade your compiler and suddenly it does something a little different and everything you thought you knew and loved about the world has changed. Okay, let's see. There we go. Now, it's, now that we have initialized the global variable and initialized the static variable, the compiler has decided to put both of them in the data section. So now we have a rough idea of where certain types of variables are stored, but the most important type of variable are gonna be our stack variables. These are all our normal variables that you know and love. If I now do, I'm gonna modify my demo very quickly. Um, and then I will do that. Compile it again. And I can see that now the data segment has gone down. It's only four because this is no longer a static variable. But there is no variable, there's no, it seems like I has gone missing. Why has I gone missing? Where is I going to be now? I just said it. I is going to be put on the stack. But the stack is different from our global variables and our static variables in that it changes as the program runs. Because it's tied to a given function, in this case it was tied to the main function, if you think back to our last lecture on recursion, when we have a function that function has variables, those variables get added and destroyed as functions start and end. So it doesn't actually make sense for our program that we just wrote with our variable i inside of main to pre-decide where that i is going to go because if uh, main calls, when main runs, it's going to put something on the stack, it'll have the variable i in there. If we run another function with a variable j, that'll go on. When that function finishes, that part of the stack will get destroyed and we'll be back at the bit where i is. So it doesn't make sense to pre-allocate them, instead you allocate them as you go. So remember how C was passed by value? That was also some of our recent discussion. What do you think would happen if we passed a function an address? Someone new. Um, okay, in the blue. So what would happen if I give a function an address? Is there any, what, what's gonna happen to that variable? What will be inside the function? No, it's a bit of a tricky question. Like, uh, if you give a function to, to the, like, uh, you mean the variable? Yeah, so let's say, let's make it a little bit easier. Let's say I have a function f of x, and I give it x equals three. What happens in, when that function starts? What happens to x? Uh, 
I have x in main, x was three, and I have a new function f, and I give it x. When I said, well, we had this whole demo with writing stuff with the photocopier, what was the function doing when it started? It starts running, but remember it made a photocopy of the variable, essentially, it copied the variable. So if you gave it x, to, if you gave uh, the function f a variable x from main, and then you start f, what does the computer do? I just said it a second, a second ago. It just copies x, right? So it copies that x, x was three in main, it puts a second copy of it in f, and then if I add one to x inside of f, what happens? Which variables change? Uh, I think it's the copy one. The one. Yeah, the copied one changes and the original one doesn't. So we're making progress. Now let's do it with an address. So let's say I copy an address um, and what's an address? What kind of object is it? It's a number, right? So if I, instead of giving x just being the number three, let's say I give it an address, what first happens when I go into function f? We'll find, find the address. It's not gonna find the address. What's the, but we just said what happens when you start a new function, what happens to the arguments? They get, they get copied. So I've made a copy of the address. Is copying down someone's address the same as copying what's at the address? No. Like if I, if I ask you for your address at home and you say I'm number five and I write that down on my piece of paper, I haven't actually copied your, your whole home. I've just written down your address, which is obviously pretty different. So now what might this allow us to do? If I have your address and I've copied it, what could I now do? Sorry, Ivani. I know you're dying to say something. Yeah, you can go to that address. So what we can do, if we, I now go to the original location that the address points to and I make a change to it, will it impact the original one? Yeah, it'll impact the original one. The reason is, is that all you've copied is the address. So there are two copies of the address, but there's still only one real thing. So it's very different from copying, let's say we had the mailboxes, it's different from copying what's inside the mailbox rather than just copying the address of the mailbox. If two mailboxes have the same address inside them, which points to a third mailbox, and then both of them change what's inside the third mailbox, well, that thing will have changed twice, right? So this is essentially the whole motivation here, is that we can now have a way for functions to impact memory that is elsewhere in the computer by passing around addresses. Thank you very much. Short round of applause. You're all right. So if you know where a variable is in memory, and you have permission to touch it, so ordinarily if it's part of your same program, then you can change it. If you don't have permission, what happens? Segfault. Okay, a pointer can be null, but what happens if we try and visit location that is null? What's the computer gonna do? If you dereference a null pointer, segfault. Um, this is uh, feature of the operating system, even though in theory there is a, a place where the memory does begin. So it's a trap and probably our last trap for the day. Just remember that the asterisk symbol is used lots of ways. So it is used way number one. It's up there on the slides. You can just read it back to me. Multiplication, Multiplication way number two. Dereferencing, De way number three. Great. And with that, have a great rest of the day and I will see you tomorrow.